Oh, yeah. All right. So for all those who are here and all those who will be joining us, um, welcome to our sixth installment of the MyOCD Care Lecture Series. I'm so excited to be joined by Dr. Jonathan Abramowitz, um, who who will be discussing the topic of the importance of science in clinical psychology. First, a couple of announcements um, about some upcoming talks we have. Uh, the first is John Hirschfield, MFT, the acclaimed author of um, Harm OCD and other great books. Uh, we'll be discussing the art of the meme, educating the public on OCD through pop culture, and that's January 30th at 3 p.m. Uh, two talks that are coming up in February. Um, on the 6th is Chrissy Hodges, the founder of the OCD advocacy group, OCD Game Changers. Uh, she'll be discussing the unique role of peer support specialists um, in the certification process. Um, so the, their role in mental health care and OCD treatment. And on the 13th, I'll be giving a talk. Um, it's called Parents as Therapeutic Agents, Treating Childhood Anxiety and behavioral issues, issues through parenting. And uh, hopefully we'll have a nice live event in New York City and uh, we'll of course stream it live. All information is on myocdcare.com and you're all uh, welcome to check out more information about it there. And now for the moment we've all been waiting for, uh, I'll introduce our speaker. Uh, Dr. Jonathan Abramowitz, PhD, is professor of psychology and psychiatry and director of the Anxiety and Stress Disorder Clinic at the University of North Carolina. Um, an internationally recognized expert on OCD and anxiety, he's published over 300 research articles, books, uh, many of which grace my office, <laughs> and book chapters. Oh, uh, he's reading them, that's nice. Oh yeah, they're wonderful. Um, Jonathan is a past president of the Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies and is currently editor of the Journal of Obsessive Compulsive and Related Disorders. He's a regular presenter at professional conferences and received numerous awards for his cont uh, contributions to the field. Uh, without further ado, I give you Dr. Jonathan Bromwitz. Well, thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here, and I really appreciate, Elliot, what you're, what you're doing for the community um, with all these webinars and everything else. It's a really great um, service that, that you're providing, so thanks a lot, and. I'm glad that people are tuning in and catching up on stuff. Let me share my screen here. All right, so hopefully you can see. Maybe I'll just ask if you're here. Um, we're going to we're going to talk about why we need science in in clinical psychology and. Um, as, as Elliot mentioned, I'm a, a professor at University of North Carolina in, in, in Chapel Hill, and a lot of this material comes from um, a class that I teach on introduction to clinical psychology, and some of it comes from a class I teach on um, just the, the importance of, of science and critical thinking and, and things like that. We have a lot of fun. We talk about um, things like, I'll get back to that in a second, we talk about things like what is science? What are the advantages of science? And in particular, why, why we need science in clinical psychology. So that's kind of a, a, an overview. Um, ironically, I, I just got back about a week ago from a 10 day bus tour of Spain with my family. This is my family here. We're in, we're in Barcelona. And we were with um, 30 other people, all from the US and Canada. And you know, we spent time in the major cities in, in um, in, in Spain, and that's not what's ironic. The ironic thing was that there was a guy on the trip from somewhere in Ontario, somewhere outside of Toronto, who was a clinical psychologist. And, and I thought, oh boy, this is gonna be great. This guy's gonna be my, my buddy. We're gonna bond over you know, our love of cognitive behavior therapy and empirically supported treatments and exposure therapy and all this. And so it turns out that the first conversation I have with this guy, he tells me that he's into a bunch of kind of unscientific, non-empirically supported therapies like equine therapy, energy therapies, um, rebirthing, um, and things like that. And not only that, but he tells me that he's kind of sad that clinical psychology is bought into this Western, you know, medical model of psychology where there's symptoms and diseases and that we need research and assessments. He, he kind of rejects this in favor of kind of more Eastern 
um, traditional approaches, like looking at the whole person. And, you know, we, we, I wasn't going to be um, confront, confrontational with him because I just met him and we had to spend 10 days together. But at some point in the conversation, I asked him, well, you know, how do you know that what you're doing works if you don't believe in the science and all this stuff? And he told me that, you know, well, I, I see my clients getting better, so I know that they, that they must get better. Um, and he seemed perfectly satisfied with, with this answer. Um, and, you know, and, and he said things like, you know, studies, they look at the average person. They wouldn't help me with the actual people that, that I work with. I need to use my judgment. I need to use my intuition. Um, I know what my patients need, and, and that's better than any research study. You know, and I know that what I do works and, and stuff like that. So, you know, we're having this conversation over, you know, at a group dinner. The guy's a little older than I am. Um, it's kind of the beginning of the trip, so I didn't push the guy too far. But to suffice it to say, I, I kind of wanted to send him a, a link to attend this this webinar. Um, and we'll kind of come come back to that. But as, as I said, this is what we're gonna this is what we're gonna cover today. So let's start with the background of of what is science, and we'll kind of um, we won't be too basic because people hopefully hopefully I'm preaching to the choir about this stuff. But science is basically the most effective. Um, problem solving strategy that we have as, as human beings. Um, it's not perfect, it has imperfections, but over the last three centuries, it's resulted in unprecedented growth of knowledge, unprecedented technological advances, it saves lives, um, it so helps to solve you know, real world problems, helps lots of people. And as clinical psychologists, we need to consider science not because it's flawless, because it isn't, but because it's worked so well. And certainly better than than anything you know before, that came before science. Um, so science is just simply the best tool we have for acquiring knowledge. Knowledge, and what it results in is a slow but steady progress in terms of eliminating errors in the way that we think. It eliminates errors in in our beliefs. Um, and again, there's no there's no plan B, right? There's no alternative to, to, to science. There's no other tradition like, or there's no other approach like tradition or folklore or faith that comes close to science when it comes to problem solving effectiveness. The thing is the field of clinical psychology is sometimes confused about this issue, right? So just like my, my friends, some clinicians sometimes believe that they should use their professional knowledge um, of, you know, when, or I guess when they're working with patients and, and clients. But it's unclear what that professional knowledge really means. So often people are talking about anecdotes, which we'll get to a little bit later. Um, anecdotes are, of course, you know, reliance on, on personal experiences. But sometimes um, clinical psychologists rely on tradition. Sometimes they rely on folklore. Um, but as we've talked about, all these, these um, strategies pale in comparison to science when it comes to problem solving. Um, so what does science provide for the field? It gives us a foundation for understanding behavioral, in our case, psychological uh, phenomena. It gives us a body of evidence to guide assessment, to guide treatment. And, you know, we have this, this wonderful scientific method. What is it? It's a way of asking a question that allows us to systematically collect data using controlled observation so that we can test guesses that we have about the way the world works. We can test hypotheses, right? So an important aspect of the scientific method is that it's self-correcting. We ask these questions, we get these data, we draw these conclusions, we exchange the conclusions freely in peer-reviewed you know, journal articles that are hopefully widely disseminated and accessible. We encourage other people to replicate our, our experiments. And if people can't replicate them, then there's, there's something wrong with the, with the theory. We need to go back. We need to question, you know, is, is what we're doing correct? If lots of other laboratories do corroborate findings, then maybe, maybe we're, we're on to something. And that's what helps a field like clinical psychology advance gradually. Um, you probably know what a hypothesis is, right? Some sort of educated guess about the relationship between, between variables. Um, another important concept here is reliability. Do you get the same finding the same result over and over again, right? When we ask what's the reliability of a research finding, it's can the results be replicated? Can they be reproduced? And a theory, of course, is a group of hypotheses, a group of principles that explain some aspect of, of an area of, of interest. And, you know, I can, we, we've talked about these issues of, um, 
you know, reliability. A demonstration that I do with, with uh, my classes when I teach them is I give them this, this theory of human behavior that we each have an invisible man, um, like a Martian, sitting on our shoulder and whispering into our ears telling us what to do. And I ask them what they think of the theory, and I ask them to try to disprove it. And they try over and over again. And of course, you can't disprove it because the Martian is, is invisible, right? You, you, you can't see him. And so, you know, you, you can't prove or disprove that, that he's there. And so in order to be scientific, a theory has to be falsifiable. You have to be able to say, you have to be able to provide evidence that it's, that it's not true um, in order for the theory to be useful at, at all. It's useless in explaining something if we can't subject it to an honest test to see if it's, if it's really true. And the other thing about science is that we can't accept anything until it's demonstrated. So if I hypothesize that, I don't know, schizophrenia can be cured by swimming with dolphins, right? Or fluorescent, light, fluorescent lights cause hyperactivity. Um, it's my obligation to prove that these things are true. It's not someone else's obligation to prove me wrong. The burden of proof lies with the person who's making the claim. If I say a treatment works, I've got to demonstrate that a treatment works. Um, and, and, and so the burden of proof does not lie with the, the naysayers who say that it doesn't work. I've got to prove that it, that it does work. Now, it's safe to say that the public has a problem with science literacy these days. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples of um, kind of pseudoscience that people believe. I don't know how many people believe that Tom Cruise is a space alien. But here's another example that you can just take this head-on product and you just wipe it on your forehead and it makes headaches go away. Or that you can wear some sort of a magnet or some sort of bracelet and you get the, the soothing power of copper and um, the Jesus bracelet will make all of your problems go away. It's, it's therapeutic. This is um, a particularly chilling one, no, no a pun uh, not intended. So this was from 2014. This is Senator James Inhofe, um, and he was in the Senate, and he brought a snowball in the Senate, and he said, we keep hearing in 2014 that it's the warmest year on record, and I asked the chair, do you know what this is? It's a snowball, and it's from outside here, so it's very, very cold out, right? A glaring example of scientific illiteracy because climate change has nothing to do with the daily weather, right? These are long-term trends. And this guy who is one of the hundred people who's, you know, kind of in charge of our country, um, one of our leaders doesn't, doesn't quite understand that. This is a list of just data that I took from some surveys that I could find on prevalence of certain types of beliefs. And look at, like from a, a quarter to a third to, in some instances, close to a half of people in our country have some pretty, I would say, wacky beliefs. Um, believing in ghosts and witches and astrology. Um, believing that antibiotics kill viruses. They don't, they, they kill bacteria. Lasers don't focus sound waves, they, they focus light waves. Um, humans and dinosaurs did not coexist, even though um, about half of people in our country, and I have a hard time believing that, but um, them's the data. Um, and so this last one about humans and dinosaurs coexisted. I'm going to say a little bit more about that. You might have seen this guy before if you watch the show Duck Dynasty, which I, I haven't actually. Um, but this is Phil Robertson. He believes in a strict interpretation of Genesis and thinks that men walked with the dinosaurs. And he's a founding member of Ken Ham's Creation Museum in Kentucky, which if you go to, you will see this display, which looks like Jesus riding on a on a dinosaur. Um, so we have problems with scientific literacy for understanding science, for paying attention to data um, and, and things like that. This is another great prank um, that, I forget how I was introduced to this, but this was played on a population in a town in Idaho some years ago. DHMO kills, it's a big sign that was you know, posted around town. It might've been in a school. Um, what's the danger of DHMO? Death by inhalation, corrodes metals, it causes all sorts of terrible things like electrical short circuits and tissue damage and soil erosion. And it's used in abortion clinics and animal research and nuclear plants. And, you know, we should ban it because it's found in cancerous tumors. It's this terrible thing. We should ban dihydrogen monoxide. What's dihydrogen monoxide? Hopefully you've caught on. This is water, of course. 
but the vast majority of people filled out a form endorsing that we should ban uh, H2O, essentially. Um, so again, scientific illiteracy in, in our country. This is, back to Spain, this is the Alhambra, and if folks have been, to, this is my daughter, um, this is an, an ancient palace. If you've been to Granada, Spain, then maybe you've been on a tour of Alhambra. Um, parts of it were actually originally built by the Romans. You can kind of see the architecture. It looks a little bit like the um, amphitheater in, um, in, in Rome. Um, but so it was originally built 2,000 years ago, but it's actually been used by different ruling dynasties. The Muslims were there in um, the year 711, um, something I learned on my trip. The Moors um, occupied it for a while. Anyway, it's on a beautiful plateau that sits right outside of Granada. Architecture is amazing. If you go to Spain, definitely check out uh, Alhambra. So back to science. Why do we need science? Let's talk a little bit about um, this in general, then we'll apply it to, to clinical psychology. So we need science because our personal experience is, is tainted. Um, we can't trust our personal experience as much as we think that we can, as much as it might seem. Even if you're a really smart person, highly educated person, there still are factors that get in the way of being able to know the truth about, about things. Um, we need a tool that will transcend these factors and help us to be more objective. So let's talk about some of these, these factors that get in the way of, of trusting our personal experience. And one of these is what we call naive realism. And this is essentially the belief that the world is pretty much as we see it. So I guess technically you would define it as human, the human tendency to believe that what we see, uh, I'm sorry, to believe that we see the world around us objectively and that people who disagree with us must be uninformed irrational or, or biased. Um, but really, perception is constructive, right? Our perceptions don't have a one-to-one -one relationship to external reality. Perception is constructive, which means that our minds kind of manufacture what we perceive. Um, what we perceive to be out there is really determined, you know, not only by our five senses and what they detect, but also by things like what we know already, what we expect to find, our beliefs, and, and of course, our psychological state as well. And here's a, a classic example, right? So this is the, from the Flat Earth uh, Society, right? Not many centuries ago, they believed that you could just sail right off the edge of the Earth if you went out you know, to the horizon. And it sure looks that way. If you stand on the beach and you look out there, you know, but of course, seeing is not really believing. Here's a more clinical psychology uh, example. This is actually from a, uh, a book, a, a self-help book, an older one for OCD. It's called Brain Lock by Jeffrey Schwartz. And this is a, a, um, a positron emission tomography scan, a PET scan of the, of the brain. And we want to look at this and we want to be, oh my goodness, look, the obsessive compulsive person, look at all that red and that yellow. You know, there must be some sort of defect in the brain. But really what this is, is a highly processed kind of statistical representation of events that are going on in the brain. It's not really the case that parts of the brain light up, right? Even though you hear that, this part of the brain lights up. Um, and I actually have a great deal of concern <clears throat> about these kinds of brain imaging studies and some of the pictures that they publish in journals because they produce these images that vastly distort what's actually going on. Um, the brains of people with OCD are probably not much different, if at all, than people uh, without OCD. And, this particular image simply means that, you know, parts of the brain in one person with OCD happen to be working harder than the same parts in a particular person without OCD at a specific point in time. It's highly cherry picked and it really doesn't tell us very much that's useful. It could be that the person with OCD is kind of stressed out about something. They're worried about something. So of course there's going to be more activity in, in the frontal lobes of their of their brain. But people draw all sorts of conclusions, causal conclusions from these things. And I could come back and do another uh, webinar where we talk about some of the problems with these um, kinds of studies. And what about this one? So this is, this is what we call a pareidolia. Um, we like to ascribe meaning to the meaningless. Um, why do we do this? The, the human mind is not comfortable with ambiguity, right? Probably because of survival. We like to have answers. It's just the way we work. 
So this is looks like you know a Cinnabon, <laughs> um, but if you kind of look at it a certain way, it, it kind of looks like Mother Teresa. I think that's hysterical. Um, I can show you some other examples of this. So this is a cloud and it's looks like a horse. So people could, you know, look at that and make all sorts of conclusions, but it's a cloud probably only stayed up there for a couple seconds that way. And then the winds blew it apart. It's kind of an ominous looking set of, uh, or I guess one pepper kind of cut open, but it looks like the pepper is, looks like something you'd see at Halloween time. If you've been to the Delaware Water Gap in Pennsylvania, um, then maybe you've checked out the, the Indian head. So you can see my cursor here. Here's the eye, here's the nose, here's the mouth. And if you happen to be there at the certain, you know, time of day with the sun shining the right way, you know, kind of an interesting um, phenomenon. And here's our good old Rorschach test that we use to assess people and make decisions about diagnosis and hospitalization and treatments and legal issues. Is someone fit to be a parent, competent to stand trial based on this test and also these other sorts of, um, this is the thematic, app, one of the cards of the thematic app perception test. Um, and the thing is the people who use these tests, they interpret, um, they interpret these things and usually go beyond what, what's really, what they can really take from the interpretations. I'm actually no expert, I was never trained in the, in the Rorschach, but what we know from research is that people go beyond, they focus too much on people's interpretation of these, um, the ink blot and the situation, and it turns out that that's not the most important thing when you're supposed to score this measure. Um, again, I'm, I'm not an expert, but I do know that the Rorschach has very poor inter-rater inter reliability. You can't get too scores to, to give the same answer very often. They have used different rules for scoring this. Um, and I actually don't believe it tells us much more, if anything, than a good clinical interview could and might even uh, muddy the waters and confuse things. So pareidolias. Another one of these um, biases is the fallibility of, of memory. So our memories are also constructed and they're often creative. Our memories are not like factual recordings of events. It's not like you're turning on, you know, uh, um, your your tape player and, and recording everything that's being that's being spoken or, or you know recording something with a camera. We're actually very selective in what we pay attention to, and what sticks in our memories also is is very selective, and it's not necessarily accurate. And and what we attend to and what we remember depends on lots of different factors what kind of mood we're in, how much attention we're paying, what we're paying attention to, what are our expectations of the situations. Um, you know, and, and research shows that memories of eyewitnesses to crimes are unreliable. You're probably familiar with some of that uh, famous research from Elizabeth Loftus. Why is this the case? We don't pay attention to details typically. We have expectations about, you know, what, what we're supposed to see, what we expect to see. And it turns out that we reconstruct events from fragments of memories and we fill in the blanks with biases and other information that might not necessarily be reliable. It's more subjective stuff. <coughs> kind of similar to this is a premonition where we think of something and then it happens, right? Have you ever thought about some sort of a song and then it comes on the radio, right? But what about, and, and you think, oh my goodness, you know, I have some sort of, you know, ESP. Um, but what about all the times when you've thought about a song and it doesn't come on the radio? Or what about all the songs that come on the radio and you weren't thinking about them? Or maybe we're just more likely to think about songs that are popular that are also the songs that are likely to be played on the radio. Um, it's the same for dreams. And if I can go back to this Spain trip, again, I realize I'm talking a lot about that, but I had a really great time. Um, there was a woman on the trip, you meet all sorts of interesting people on these trips, um, who told me that she had special dreams that were premonitions about actual events and she has some you know, special power to have dreams about things that are gonna happen because a few times she dreamt about something and then you know, it, it correlated with, with real life. Um, but again, you have you know, many dreams every night and this woman's had probably thousands of dreams in her life and she's forgetting about all the ones that don't come true and she's focusing on the ones that, that so we, we selectively remember these events because they stick out for us. And especially if we fancy ourselves as someone who has special dreams, we're going to remember that. We're going to interpret it in certain ways. And it fools us into believing and reinforces these beliefs that we have some sort of special power like, you know, premonitions and, and ESP and stuff like that. 
We also need to be skeptical of personal experience because we often see what we want to see. And this is called subjective validation. So when we fit information into our own theories about ourselves and the world, um, examples are things like, you know, tarot cards, palm readings. Take a look at this. I'll shut up for a second and let you read this um, statement here. So this is a horoscope, right? And, and you know, you can see how, how vague it is. It would apply to anyone to some extent or another. And we can use our hindsight, right, to come up with some sort of valid excuse for why this might be relevant to, to me, right? And it's easy for people to fall for this and to fool ourselves because, you know, we all behave differently on different occasions. So we can look back and, you know, this vaguely written horoscope, um, you know, we can say, yeah, that's right. Another example is handwriting analysis. So this is Donald Trump's signature, and this is somebody interpreting the signature. This came out during the presidential campaign in 2016. So right smack in the middle, you know, this, I saw this in some newspaper or something. Donald Trump's signature on the web, probably. Donald Trump's signature has absolutely no curves, only angles. Curves in handwriting show softness, nurturing, and a material nature. Angles show a writer who is feeling angry, determined, fearful, competitive, or challenged. When a script is completely devoid of curves, the writer lacks empathy and craves power, prestige, and admiration. Besides the big-headedness that shows in this script, there is something else that's rather oversized. That's the P in Trump. This large phallic symbol shouts, me, big hunk of a man. So aside from probably being able to guess the, the writer's um, political leaning, um, hindsight is, is 20-20. So it's easy to go back and take a look at someone's handwriting and see what you want to see, right? The man is running for president. We knew all the details, more details than we wanted to know about the guy's um, private life. But try analyzing someone's handwriting who isn't, you know, running for president, who isn't very famous, and then predict um, what, what, how they're going to behave or how they behave without knowing them. You know, that's, that's a different story. Um, if you're a Led Zeppelin fan, maybe you'll appreciate this, but one of the, one of my favorite songs of all time, not to mention just um, in, in the Led Zeppelin catalog is Stairway to Heaven. So I'm gonna play you a brief uh, snippet of Stairway to Heaven here. Hopefully this is gonna work. If there's a button in your head, don't be alone there. So that's Stairway to Heaven. And now I'm going to play you a snippet of the same song, but we're going backwards. So this is backwards, Stairway to Heaven. Just again, a couple of lines. So I play this for my, my class, my class is at, at UNC, and, and I ask them, you know, raise your hand if you heard the word Satan when I played it backwards. And most of the students, they kind of look around. First of all, unfortunately, a lot of them are not familiar with the song, which is horrifying. Um, they say, oh yeah, my dad listens to that, but um, they, they don't hear the word Satan. And then I say to them, well, so if you didn't hear the word Satan, you probably also didn't hear, here's to my sweet Satan, the one whose little path would make, you, would make me sad, whose power is Satan. Oh, he'll give you, give you 666. There was a little tool shed where he made us suffer, sad Satan. Um, you probably didn't hear that. But the extraordinary thing is this. I'm going to play the snippet, the backward snippet for you again. And this time you're going to hear these words. And I swear I'm not cheating. You might assume that I'm manipulating the song or that I played it differently. But what I'm going to play is the exact same thing that you just heard. Stairway to Heaven, a little snippet of it played backwards. And I just have to promise you that I'm not cheating. I also promise you will hear all of these words. Um, you'll hear them quite clearly. So let me play this again. Here we go. Okay. 
exactly. So what's with that? I find this extraordinary. Extraordinary, <laughs> excuse me. Um, the first time I played it for you, it sounds like gibberish, right? But then I played it again and, and you know, you heard these lines about Satan and his, and his little tool shed. How does that work? What, what changed? Well, I suggested some words. I promised you that you would hear them. So I gave you an expectation and your brain loves to fill in the patterns and meaning. This is just gibberish. It's just the sound of the words being played backwards. They, they weren't really recording um, these words. Um, but the thing is that our brain fills in the gaps and this actually happens all the time. Um, and often the brain gets it right, right? That's how we're, you know, we are able to function fairly well, most of us as, as humans. But sometimes if there's a big enough expectation, um, your brain can fill in the gaps and you end up seeing or hearing something that really isn't there. And it's only because you expected to hear it. And it's really, it's, it's an incredibly powerful um, phenomenon. And we, we call this confirmation bias, which I'll talk about in just a second, as soon as I tell you a little bit about Valencia. So this is my family in Valencia. It's the third largest city in Spain after Madrid and Barcelona. And it's a, it's a bustling place with lots of shopping. And what I liked about it, they have a really cool harbor. Um, there's a beautiful, um, it's beautiful architecture from modernity, but also in, um, from ancient times and cool little markets and places to check out. So if you go to Spain, definitely check out Valencia. Again, it's another city that's kind of on the coast of Spain, on the, on the Mediterranean Sea. So back to confirmation bias. What is confirmation bias? This is the tendency to seek out evidence that supports our beliefs and discount information that, that discounts our beliefs, discount information that doesn't, that, that seems to go against our beliefs. And I like nerdy comics, so Let's begin the meeting, but um, I'm aware that I'm documenting all of your, but be aware that I'm documenting all of your bullying behavior. Uh, I'm not even close to being a bully, but now your confirmation bias will make everything I say sound like bullying to you. Can you repeat the part after you implied that I'm a delusional witch? So again, once the person believes that they're a bully, they're gonna fill that in with all sorts of um, extraneous information that isn't necessarily true. Did you read my paper on confirmation bias? Yes, but it only proved what I already knew. <laughs> um, why does this happen? We like to be right. Human beings like to be right. Um, that's just the way that we are. And, and so, you know, um, we like to think that our beliefs are correct. So we tend to look for evidence that's gonna confirm them. And this is really strong. And you've probably observed this in your friends, but of course not in yourself. Um, but that's why I always suggest to, to my students, and really uh, as a general rule of thumb, to tune in to the other side of debates, particularly like political debates. You know, it's, it's good to kind of um, keep yourself honest and, and just because you have your opinions and believe a certain way doesn't necessarily mean that everyone feels that way. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. There might be perfectly rational um, perspectives that you don't agree with. Um, that doesn't mean that uh, we shouldn't pay attention to those things. So the best way to overcome a confirmation bias, if anyone ever asks you, um, is to open yourself up to both sides of, of the debate. We'll come back to confirmation bias a little bit later. Another one of these um, cognitive biases is what we call the availability bias. So, whoops, uh, I went ahead of myself. Availability bias is when we base judgments on evidence that's vivid or that's easy to recall instead of kind of more trustworthy information like scientific data. Um, and this sort of evidence sticks in our minds and we misjudge its importance or frequency because of the, because it's vivid, because it's easy to, to remember. So are you more likely to be killed by a shark or to drown in your bathtub? Ponder that for a second. <coughs> so the answer, and so people, generally believe that they're more likely to be killed by a shark because shark attacks get a lot of media. And I'm showing you a picture of an angry looking shark here. Um, shark attacks get a lot of media. It sounds pretty awful. So they stick out in their memory, but actually here are the data shark attacks, like one in almost 4 million people, like those are pretty, pretty good odds against being attacked by a shark. And I've met people who won't go to the beach, who won't go in the water because they're afraid of getting attacked by, by a shark. Uh, by that um, 
logic, I tell them you shouldn't get in your car and drive anywhere. Um, and drowning in your tub, meanwhile, is like one in half a million. So I'll take both odds, but certainly you're much more likely to drown in your tub than you are to be attacked by, um, by a shark. Um, and related to this is the idea of, of superstition. So availability bias is related to superstition and it contributes to superstition. Many athletes, for example, have superstitious rituals that they use because they feel like these rituals help them to perform better. And baseball is a great example. You see guys that, you know, they tap their feet and do all sorts of, you know, stuff before they, you know, throw a pitch or, or get in the batter's box or stuff like that. And we can use this two by two table to understand this. When rituals are performed and there's a positive result, so a guy gets on base, gets a hit, then using the ritual is reinforced. That's, that's cell A. But what about all the times when um, the person does the ritual, so a batter you know, gets in the batter's box, does their ritual, and they don't get on base or they get out. And a good batting average in baseball is 300 or 0.3. Um, of a percentage, which is actually pretty lousy. It means 70% of the time you're getting out, even when you're using your, your ritual, right? But we remember the times when we use the ritual and we get on base. And so that cell A becomes really important. The other instances we don't remember. And so they kind of fade and we end up paying um, more attention. And this leads to what's called an illusory correlation. And this is um, perceiving a relationship between variables when there is really no such relationship. So I've got examples here of like full moons causing madness, right? Or vaccines causing um, autism. Here's a more clinical example for you. I wonder about this concept of, of PANDAS, which is pediatric autoimmune neurodeficiency associated with strep. Uh, it's the idea that a person um, has a strep, and usually a kid, has a strep infection, goes to bed one night, wakes up the next day, and they've got raging OCD, um, and that it was caused by uh, the strep infection. And so if we do this kind of two-by-two two, uh, table, what we see is that we pay lots of attention to the few people, it's, it's very few people in this cell A who have strep and, and OCD. Most people with OCD don't say that it comes on overnight from a strep infection. It usually develops gradually. And so that would be, um, that would be what, cell, uh, cell C. Um, and then you've got lots of people who have had strep, I'm sorry, that'd be cell B. Lots of people who have strep infections, the majority of people have strep infections at one point or another, but OCD is like, you know, 0.2% of the population. So the vast majority of people who have strep infections are not developing OCD. And so I just wonder if we're looking for these relationships that might not really exist here. Um, and is there only really the illusion of some sort of uh, causal relationship? So let's talk about why all of this is relevant for clinical psychology, right? Why, does, why do we need science and clinical psychology? It's going to help us to get to the truth despite all these fallibilities and biases that we have, right? And it's especially an issue in clinical psych because we're all about, you know, behaviors and emotions, things that are so specific to, to people and, and often very subjective. So we have to be, as clinical psychologists, we have to be extra sensitive to, to science. It's all about understanding these subjective experiences and measuring them and observing changes in them. And because of all the biases that we've just been talking about, we can't really trust our own experience to get to the truth. Um, we really can't trust our, our intuition, anything, I believe, anything close to 100% when, um, when it comes to all of this. And so often what we're talking about here is anecdotal evidence as being kind of the biggest threat to using science or the, the most often used alternative to science in clinical psychology, the reliance on, on anecdotes like my friend from Ontario, who I mentioned before. So what are anecdotes? These, you know, here, I should show you this. Um, and another kind of snarky comment, a million badly educated people couldn't possibly be wrong, right? Anecdotal evidence. So what is it? It's appeals to personal experience that are held up as evidence for some sort of belief or, or claim. <clears throat> What's the problem with it? We can't trust them. 
um, the phenomena, the biases that I've been talking about, you know, in, in this webinar, they interfere with how we interpret and remember our personal experiences. It could be cherry picked, right? It could be non-representative, uh, our, our experiences. And so it carries very little weight and, and should carry very little weight in, in clinical psychology. Um, so testimonials about the effectiveness of treatment are examples of anecdotal evidence. So I would even argue that none of us can really be sure, if, if you're a clinician, if you're a clinical psychologist, you work with patients, none of us can be sure that what you're doing as a clinician is really helping your, your patients. So I use cognitive behavior therapy all the time. I've written treatment manuals. I've done the research. And I use it in my private practice. Sometimes it seems like, you know, my patients do better. They, they tell me that they're doing better. Not all of them, I have to admit. Um, and I might even give them, you know, a measure like the Yale Brown Obsessive Compulsive Scale or the, the Beck Depression Inventory. And I see that their scores are changing. Um, but even so, that's anecdotal evidence. And I have to be careful about the conclusions I draw about my own efficacy as a clinician. Right? What, what, what do I mean by that? Let me, let me explain a little bit. Remember naive realism, right? So it might seem that I'm objectively perceiving how my patients are responding, right? Oh, this person's clearly doing better. They're not doing as many rituals. They don't seem as afraid. But what if they're only telling me that they're getting better just to make me feel good? What if they're not really aware of their symptom severity, right? What if they're in denial or something like that? Um, what if the people who don't get better quit my therapy so I never have a chance to evaluate them at the end and see that they don't do well? And so they select themselves out and the only people that I'm left with are the people that do well. And what if that's five people, but then there are 20 others who don't do well and they leave my practice? I might you know, think that I'm a really effective therapist when um, that's not true at all. It's the majority of people didn't do very well and they, they just left. So I didn't follow up with them, right? So naive realism gets in the way of um, anecdotal evidence. Remember the fallibility of memory. Maybe I'm remembering those cases that got better and forgetting about those cases who didn't because I'd rather forget about them, right? What about confirmation bias? Maybe I have the tendency to explain away people who don't do well as you know, they were treatment resistant, so of course they weren't gonna do well, or they didn't work hard enough, right? They didn't adhere, they didn't comply with what I asked them to do. Something was wrong with them. It's easy to explain away stuff that would kind of make me feel better about the work that I do. Um, but of course the patients who do get better, right? That means I'm a, I'm a great therapist. So all of these things come into play. Availability bias is another one too, right? And again, maybe those who don't get better quit the therapy, and it's only 5% of my caseload who sticks around and does well. So my perception of my own efficacy is terribly skewed. I can't rule these things out um, as, as, a, as a clinician. Um, and so I can't say that I'm a good clinician. Doctors can't say, and you hear this all the time, he's a great doctor. He's a great psychologist. Well, uh, that's probably, probably biased. There are other reasons too that um, we can't trust anecdotes about, about therapy. So one is the variable course of, of illness. So medical problems, psychological problems for sure, wax and wane over time. Um, and, and people often come to see us when they're you know, doing really bad. So if you think about regression to the mean as well, people in my practice, they might've gotten better anyway, right? They might've gotten better if I had had them, you know, I don't know, stand on their head for an hour instead of doing exposure therapy. Um, maybe they sought treatment when they were at their worst and they were just gonna get better anyway, even, even without treatment. We also have placebo effects, right? What if it's just being with a caring person and not what I'm doing, but the fact that I'm talking to them and being a nice guy, hopefully. Um, and so they get, nearly be, they get nearly better because they expect to get better. Or they're sorts of, all sorts of, you know, kind of demand characteristics and conditions, like being in therapy, the person expects to get better in that, in that milieu, in that situation. I can't, I can't rule that out. And then overlooked causes, right? So other treatments, what if the person's having some other, you know, treatment? What if they're seeing a bartender who's given them, not seeing a bartender, what if they're going to a bar and the bartender gives them some great advice and they take that advice and that's why they get over their anxiety or their depression, 
or their tarot card reader, or they're, maybe they're getting better sleep, or using a healthy diet, or getting more exercise, or things like that. All of this means that we need to be really careful when we're drawing conclusions about the effects of psychological treatments based on anecdotes, more than being careful, but we need to really be skeptical about drawing conclusions based on, on anecdotes. Um, the other thing about anecdotes is that they put us at risk for falling for pseudoscientific claims. So let's talk a little bit about pseudoscience, right? What's pseudoscience? So alleged knowledge, beliefs, practices that are portrayed as scientific, but that actually diverge from the required standards for scientific methods or are unsupported um, by, by scientific research. And this is rampant in the mental health fields, clinical psychology being one. So we have questionable diagnoses out there like multiple personality disorder, questionable causes of abnormality, so like improper toilet training, questionable assessment techniques, we talked about the Rorschach inkblot test, questionable therapies like EMDR and energy therapies and stuff like that, questionable claims about mental and behavioral health, mercury vaccines cause autism, there's no evidence for that, all that data was faked. Um, oh, and this is the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. Um, this is a basilica that's it's actually been in, under construction for 150 years. It's funded by donations, which is why it's taken so long to complete. They're planning to have it done in 2026. And the chief architect was actually Antoni Gaudi, um, although he took over once the original designer quit the project. This thing is, it's kind of a monstrosity from the outside. It towers over the surrounding buildings in Barcelona, but the inside is beautiful. Um, it has these beautiful stained glass windows and we were actually there at sunset, so you get the effect of the light kind of shining through. One side has yellow and, and um, orange and red uh, stained glass, and the other side has uh, blue and, and purple. It's really striking and, again, well worth a visit with Sagrada Familia if you are in um, Barcelona. So I'm not going to take till 2026 to finish this webinar, but just a few more slides. Um, why is pseudoscience, what's wrong with pseudoscience? Why, why should we be concerned about all this stuff? Well, harmful treatments exist uh, in fringe psychology and in alternative medicine, suggestive techniques for memory recovery that have actually led people to confront family members about raping them when it actually never happened and caused great rifts within families. Crisis debriefing for trauma, which can actually induce PTSD in people who were not going to get PTSD in the first place. Um, attachment therapies, rebirthing therapies. Some years ago, there was a case of a child dying during rebirthing therapy. Um, you're not supposed to die during psychological treatment. Um, facilitated communication for autism, which has been, uh, again, also debunked, um, falling into many of these biases that we're talking about, confirmation bias and, and stuff like that. Pseudoscience um, also has opportunity costs. So people who pursue ineffective treatments may forego more effective scientifically validated uh, interventions and spend large amounts of time and money on both. And then finally, loss of control. So when we place blind faith in non-scientific belief systems like things like astrology and channeling and things like that, that renders us may less likely to make the necessary changes, science evidence-based changes um, in our lives. So I'll just wrap up by saying that um, hopefully I've convinced you that science is essential for evaluating claims that we encounter in the mental health fields. Um, hopefully I am preaching to the choir. It's our best safeguard against being fooled and against fooling ourselves in clinical psychology. And when we evaluate claims that we come across, we should demand evidence. We, we should, you know, Always consider alternative explanations and never just be satisfied. Always ask for, for the data. So I'm going to leave it there and see if we have any questions. But thank you for, for watching this. Um, and I guess can you hear me? I can hear you, Elliot. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, first of all, that was really, really awesome. Thank you Thanks. so much for, for doing that. Are you able to see me as well? Or is it just I can audio? see you. I'm going to unshare my screen. There we go. All right. That was really, really awesome. Um, I guess one question I have, and I think one of the reasons why I thought this would be a really 
good talk is because there's um, often like, you know, rumblings on Twitter about like whether or not, you know, CBT is as it's cracked up to be, right? And it often comes from the psychoanalytic crowd. Um, so I was curious if you could, um, I guess, like, how would you respond to those types of claims that, you know, um, I guess, number one, that CBT isn't, you know, as, as it's cracked up to be. And also, yeah, so, so I guess start there. Yeah, great question. I think that um, cognitive behavior therapy, you know, so we're talking about an empirically supported, right, lots of, lots of research, lots of um, randomized, controlled, you know, well-conducted studies. But even still, we have to be honest and say that CBT has both specific effects and non-specific effects. So what do I mean by that? The specific, effect, the specific effects of therapies are, you know, what, what you specifically are doing that's based on some sort of a theory. So let's take exposure and response prevention for OCD, one of my personal favorites. Um, you know, we're helping the person face their fears. We think that that, you know, causes extinction of fear. We're helping them to resist their rituals, which helps them to learn that, you know, they don't need these safety behaviors in order to be safe. And we think that it causes some sort of learning and, and all that. And there are many studies showing that exposure and response prevention works better than no treatment at all. It works better than some sort of like control treatment like relaxation and stuff like that. And what that tells us is that the specific procedures of exposure and response prevention um, seem to have something going for them over and above, you know, doing nothing or doing something else. That said, even the people that get, let's say, relaxation or the people that get, you know, anxiety management uh, therapy, the, the control conditions, they still have some response. It's, it's minimal, but there's some response to that. And so what that's saying is that there is a nonspecific effect of the therapy as well. And that could be just the expectation, hey, I'm, I'm with a nice you know, person who's trying to help me and, and I expect to get better because I go into therapy and I've read about this exposure. So I, I think that we need to be honest with ourselves and you know, tout uh, CBT, tout empirically supported treatments as more effective, um, you know, and, and, and we know we have a good idea as to why they work but not, you know, 100% effective because of why, you know, because of these, um, these nice theories that, that we have. There are probably other things that are more common to all psychotherapies, maybe even all interactions that are also playing into that as, as well. I, I make no bones about taking advantage of the placebo effect. I want my patients to expect to get better. I, 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 there is a lot to the placebo effect, a lot of books and research on the placebo effect, and it works. And so let's take advantage of that if clinicians, as clinicians, mm -hmm. let's not shy away from that. Um, but, but also, you know, we have good data that, uh, you know, CBT is, um, you know, th that we are doing what, what we say we're doing, or those things are having effects. Cool. Long-winded answer, but that's what I would say. Yeah, I guess since no one else is asking questions, I'll, can I ask them more? <laughs> far, far away, yeah. All right, cool. Um, I guess what has, have you ever had a situation where you were able to kind of bring someone on, or I guess help people like your friend from Oklahoma, was it? You know, kind of help them under, understand the value of evidence-based uh, psychotherapy or like what has been helpful to that end? Yeah, it's really difficult uh, if someone is already kind of ingrained in their beliefs it's, it's really difficult to get them to change their minds. So you could probably, you know, hit them with some of the stuff that we just talked about. And if they're honest, and again, they're not um, falling victim to their own confirmation bias, you know, hopefully they'll, they'll look at it and, and they'll, huh, you know, that's, that's it. I never thought about it that way. Maybe, maybe I can't trust my own, you know, anecdotes as much as I thought. But it, you know, when you're trained in something, it's really difficult to be talked out of that. Um, you know, me being trained as a cognitive behavior therapist, you know, when, so a, an example for me is the, the ACT, um, uh, you know, uh, I guess phenomenon that happened, I guess, 10, 20 years ago. And, and at first, 
you know, I was like, no, CBT, we can't do, and ACT, of course, is CBT, but exposure and response prevention, how could this treatment that's not exposure and response prevention be helpful? And I didn't want to, I didn't want to believe it. Um, and, and hope, you know, I consider myself open-minded, hopefully to some extent I'm open-minded. Um, I, I read a little bit more about it and actually got involved doing research on it with um, some people that I, you know, came to respect as scientists and changed my mind once I, you know, once I looked at it that, oh, there is something to this. And um, again, we could do a whole nother webinar on, on all of that and the similarities and differences, but um, it, it's really difficult to change people's minds. Think about if you're having like some sort of religious debate and you're trying to, you know, change someone's ideas about, you know, God or their political views or things like that. People get, um, you know, kind of really one-sided and they dig their heels in and it can be really difficult to change people's minds. So I, um, when I was, you know, a young whippersnapper, those were fun intellectual discussions to have, but being worn down by not having a lot of success uh, with <laughs> changing people's minds, I've kind of, um, unfortunately, I, I, I don't, I don't try that very often anymore. I leave that to the younger folks to, to try. Yeah, totally. Um, another question, uh, EMDR specifically, yeah. right? It, it seems like it's growing in popularity and they use like a ton of scientific terms. And I think, you know, <laughs> cured. Um, so I'm curious, like your thoughts on EMDR therapy and I, I guess, yeah, just, just how it might be potentially misunderstood as an evidence-based practice, if you could just speak a little to that. Sure. And, and I'm not an expert by any means on the MDR. I've read a lot of the research on it. Um, my understanding is that it, it actually can be helpful for people. Often it's used with PTSD, and there's some data to suggest that it's more effective than controlled treatments. But there's also data suggesting that the eye movements are not contributing to that effectiveness. Um, and actually, I've, I've more recently learned that there are actually some data suggesting that maybe the eye movements do have something to do with it. Um, but I, my understanding is that the, the majority of the data suggests that the eye movements might be superstitious. They might be superfluous. And EMDR, uh, again, my understanding, it, it involves a lot of what we might think of as, as exposure. The person's thinking about, talking about their traumatic event. Well, that's kind of what we do in, in exposure therapy. Actually, I think a lot of treatments, a lot of non-CBT treatments also do involve exposure to fear, at least in terms of, you know, imagery and, and kind of, or at least exposure to negative emotions, unwanted emotions mm -hmm. and, and thoughts and feelings. Um, so it, it might be operating based on that. But my, my belief based on the evidence that I've read is that um, it can be helpful, but not for the reasons that, you know, these folks think that, that it is. All right. Well, this was super, super fun. And I really appreciate you doing this. And this is going to be available on my YouTube channel. Um, you could go to myocdcare.com forward slash YouTube to check out this and the other videos. And I'm really looking forward to having more. And thank you once again so much to uh, Dr. Bromwitz. Thanks a lot, Elliot. Take care. Take care, be well.